and it would all sound good, but we need to make these things where it's um, accessible, um, and we need to make sure that we keep um, keep that message alive. So, United States uh, Dietary Advisory Committee just came out with new guidelines within the last couple of weeks that have been co controversial, and again, you know, many many groups with special interests have been going back and forth in terms of, um, you know, whether the, the guidelines are relevant for them, but I, I think that it was a commonsensical approach and meets a lot of people uh, in the middle. And the bottom line was more fruits and vegetables, um, whole grain seafood, legumes and nuts, um, lower in um, low and non-fat dairy products, alcohol, um, again, limited, lower red meat, and really, again, the, the biggest thing that reading through those guidelines is, is the sugar and the refined grains are a big problem. We consume in this country far too much saturated fat, far too much uh, sugar, and far too much uh, refined grain. And you know, again, they said that you know their guidelines could be met in several um, several types of diets. Um, they recommended <coughs> the vegetarian diet, uh, the healthy U.S. diet, which again I'm not completely sure what that means. They're also a Mediterranean diet. Um, so there are different ways to to get to where where they're suggesting. And um, you know, I think that again. Um, we have to just be mindful that this is the best that we can come up with right now. Uh, and I think that this is, there's some common sense that was written into these guidelines. And certainly there are certain issues with this that can continue to be debated because unfortunately most of our, our nutritional um, your guidance is based on very small studies. So we, we have much more to learn. A bunch of things we are definitely shortfall in uh, vitamin A, vitamin D, vitamin E, vitamin C. You know, and you start to look at this, and what, it, what is it telling us? Is it tells us that we're missing micronutrients. Where are we missing micronutrients? Well, we need to be eating our micro, micronutrients. You know, I, it shouldn't be that we have to rely on multivitamins and supplements. Is it means that you know, where are you going to get your multi, where, where do you get your micronutrients from? Fruits and vegetables, right? You know, in a healthy, balanced diet. So when people ask about you know what nutrient, you know what supplements, etc., eat them. <laughs> You know, make it easy. Eat a balanced diet. Make sure you're getting your green leafy vegetables. And uh, you know, this is um, a picture that was taken at one of our later walks uh, at uh, around Buttonwood Park, and we had uh, Silverbrook Farms there. And I've got my Eat More Kale um, sweatshirt on. <laughs> and you know, the idea is we need to make make sure that fruits and vegetables are accessible to people, and we need to also incorporate you know the great farms that we have around here and let people know about them. Um, in terms of primary prevention for cardiovascular disease, the Mediterranean diet and the PREDIMED study a couple of years ago suggested that you could cut down the risk of cardiovascular um, cardiovascular disease, a heart attack, stroke, heart attack, and death by about 30% by adhering to this. And, and again, this study was looking at um, supplemental uh, olive oil or supplemental nuts. So I think that what we're seeing is, is that the Mediterranean diet, which this was a randomized controlled study, um, um, suggests that if we, if, we, if we go down that road, that Mediterranean road, um, that there may be some benefit um, from a cardiovascular perspective. Now, I think the Brazilian guidelines are brilliant. The, the, this is, a, you know, they're light years ahead of where we need to be uh, because it, it, it's all common sense. And I took this from Food Politics, Mary Nestle's site, and uh, so summarized the guidelines. And prepare meals from staple and fresh foods. Use oils, fats, sugar, and salt in moderation. Limit consumption of ready-to-consume food and drink. Eat regular meals, paying attention in appropriate environments. Um, eat in company. Uh, buy foods at places which offer varieties of fresh foods. Um, teach people how to cook, develop practice, and show the skills and, and needed to cook. Uh, plan your time um, to give, give meals and eat in proper time so you're not relying on convenience. Uh, you're not relying on comfort foods. And when you eat out, choose restaurants that serve fresh foods and be critical of commercials um, for food and food products. So I think that, brilliant, you know. We, we need to have something that's as commonsensical as Brazil. And, you know, we have a lot to learn from that. So I think that this really pr pretty much summarizes Michael <laughs> Pollan in his uh, book. Um, in, uh, it, the book was from... Uh, it was in defense of food, and the subtitle was Eat Food, uh, Mostly Plants, not, not Too Much, Mostly Plants. And I like to add in the mindfulness of it, not too fast. So I think that one of the things is, is that, you know, eat food, we should really be eating mostly plants. The 
commonsensical way. We know that we need to get our micronutrients. We can get some, a lot of our macronutrients that way, uh, but we also need to slow it down. As my friend Loretta Roach says, that we're eating our foods on the, on the dashboard buffet, and it's true, right? So we're driving around, we're driving through, take, you know, we're getting takeout, we're in drive-throughs, we're in convenience stores, and we really need to slow it down. And you know, I think that you know this mindlessness that we, you know, in terms of our eating habits, is really harming us in a lot of ways. Um, added sugar is really come under fire, and it should, right? So this study was from the Journal of Internal Medicine um, a, a, about a year, year and a half ago. It says that you know added sugar is increasing our cardiovascular risk, and you know I think that we really need to know, you know, the sugars that's in real food, you know, in your fruits and your vegetables, etc. Is not really what our problem is. Our problem is, is they're adding, they've been adding sugar in for quite a while, um, and it's hard for us to even understand what, where they added sugar. It's not on the label. Where are you going to find that, right? It's, it's hard for us to understand. But there really are guidelines. American Heart Association suggests that you know, for an adult male, no more than 36, um, so 36 grams of added sugar. For females, it should be 24. For kids, 16, which goes to four teaspoons for kids, six teaspoons for females and uh, nine teaspoons for adult males. And where is that? It's not on our label. So I think that one of the important things over the next year is actually, hopefully, the FDA has been talking about changing our labels, and I think that will be important, and I think that we need to educate people. Um, you know, the WHO just came out and said, people, no more than 10% of your, your, your calories a day um, is supposed to be from uh, added sugars. And I think that's, that's something that's going to really be um, very important for our health because, you know, um, when you look at it, what's really changed in the last, um, you know, 40 years is that we've really gone to a very sugar, carbohydrate-laden uh, diet compared to where it was back in the 70s. Uh, these are two small studies, uh, uh, well, big studies, but again, not randomized studies. Um, the association between dietary whole grain and risk of mortality um, whole grain consumption is associated with decreased mortality and decreased cardiovascular mortality, whole grain. You be careful though because we eat mostly refined grains and that's one of the things we should really be cautious about. Okay, we eat a lot of breads, pasta, and cereal that's refined grains, um, you know, white flour, etc. You know, <coughs> think about, you know, if we're going to have whole grains, brown rice, quinoa, you know, oatmeal. And then the other controversial, which will continue to be debatable in terms of saturated fats and fats, um, the only fats that were associated in this meta-analysis, when they looked at a whole string of studies and put them together, was the trans fats are really increasing our risk of cardiovascular risk, which is man-made fats. Uh, <clears throat> not necessarily the saturated fats or the polyunsaturated fats, but I would also caution that, you know, I don't think that people should be turning around and eating beef, you know, three meals a day. You know, I think that we should we should have a, a more of a discussion and there needs to be more knowledge that we need to gain uh, through further studies. So again, <coughs> this is a picture of uh, Kim Ferreira and uh, she's doing great work in mass and motion. So it's great to talk about these things, but we have to have deliverables, right? We have to have people out there that are doing the work necessary. And Kim's doing a great job. Healthy Markets is identified places in New Bedford which are um, food deserts and trying to incorporate you know, fruits and vegetables as being something that's, that's more of a role in some of these smaller markets. Um, she's also um, uh, has a healthy dining program in New Bedford where I think it's now 13, probably 15 restaurants that have to have um, vegetables, healthier options that are available on the menu to be recognized. And I think that these are, these are really big steps to making sure that people's awareness um, is, um, is brought to the level that you know, they can get these items uh, without having to um, uh, without having to travel too far. Um, our farms are pretty strong around here. Uh, Southeastern Mass uh, Agricultural Partnership is plenty of farmers markets in, in the area and you know we really need to make sure that we support these. Uh, they're doing great work. you know when we put money into our own community it, it is going to help us dramatically. And you, we really need to come up with creative ways in order to get fruits and vegetables into um, people's hands. But we also need to make sure that they know how to cook. It's one thing to have fruits and vegetables, but then if they don't know how to cook, then we've got, we've got a problem, right? It's going to sit there. Um, this is um, in the corner over here. Henry, Henry Bousquet is one of the city councilors in New Bedford. He also is a culinary arts instructor at Greater Bedford Vogue. And, you know, 
this is a program that was going on at the Boys and Girls Club in New Bedford, and this is actually a cooking program that goes, at, goes on the Cushman Farmer's Market. So people are starting to realize that, okay, getting the produce is important, but we have to teach people again how to cook because I think, unfortunately, um, many people do not have the skills or the skill set anymore because we, we, we live in a, a very takeout nation, right? So, unfortunately, we, gotta get, we have to get people the means of getting back into the kitchen. Uh, this is exciting uh, because this is, you know, one of the first um, times that athletes have really come back, come to bat to support fruits and vegetables. Um, you know, usually our, our athletes are getting millions of dollars. I think LeBron James made $54 million in endorsements, $4 million which comes from McDonald's. Um, and he had a little snafu the other day where he, he actually uh, said that he doesn't eat at McDonald's anymore. Uh, and then he realized he's still supporting them, um, or he's still uh, in endorsing them. <laughs> so um, they were all over that. So you know, fruits and vegetables, this is, this is through the Partnership for Healthy America, which I know Michelle Obama has been very important in terms of um, pushing her message to make sure that we get back to you know, diet being a big part of her health. Um, in the corner here, uh, this is, Stephen, uh, this is um, Stephen Curry of the Golden State Warriors. This is Cam Newton. Uh, who's quarterback for um, uh, he's quarterback for the Carolina Panthers, and I think Jessica Alba. So we, we have some celebrities that are stepping up um, and talking about fruits and vegetables, and we need to have more of that because we need we need a voice. And you know, it would be great for some of these athletes that are supporting you know probably the wrong message to turn around and tell people really what they eat. And you're not going to be a professional athlete and eat junk; it just doesn't happen unless it's certain sports. Okay, right? If you're a lineman for you know, uh, on a football team, maybe maybe you're eating some junk. But, you know, I think that, you know, for many athletes, you know, in order to attain a high level um, and be competitive, they have to eat healthy. So what are we up against? We're really up against um, the food giants, right? Salt, sugar, fat. This book was fantastic. Michael Moss really uncovered, you know, what is, you know, what food science is doing to us. You know, and, you know, there is this combination. They've got us hooked, right? That combination of what it tastes good. You're going to come back for it. Right, um, but it may not be good for us, and you know we need to we need to get beyond that, and we need to bring awareness that these foods are being you know manufa manufactured in such a way to be addictive. We also need people that are working at a higher level, um, and Tim Ryan has actually really been very interesting. He's a congressman out of Ohio, and Tim Tim's great because he he wrote his first book with Mindful Nation, which talks about mindfulness after meeting John Kabat-Zinn on a five-day retreat. And he got reelected, which, you know, one would say in Ohio that may be pretty difficult, but more recently, in the last year, he wrote the book uh, Real Food Revolution, which is a book that talks about getting um, our subsidies back to the small and, mo and moderate or medium-sized farms and away from the big, um, the big um, uh, commodity crops, so we, we're eating healthier. And, and, you know, I think that that's exactly what we need to do, is we need to support getting produce or micronutrients macronutrients um, from fruits and vegetables, and you know he's he's trying to do this in a way down in Washington D.C. But a really interesting guy, and if you get a chance, both of these books I would say would be highly recommended. Um, so we struggle with not only the health, the, the the nutrients in our food, but we also struggle obviously with our, our obesity crisis that we face. Uh, this study from 2009 basically said the people if they adhere to a reduced calorie diet, um, they can have meaningful weight loss regardless of the macronutrients. So some people may feel one way or another that their diet needs to be a certain way. If they're able to cut the calories in some ways, they are able to be successful. However, um, more recently in the last year, uh, a study out of Tulane basically said a low-carbohydrate diet um, fared better in a lot of respects compared to a low-fat diet. Um, although. There's a lot of people, especially in the vegan bent, that are concerned that the low fat wasn't low fat enough. But the bottom line was, is limiting the carbs, there was a 12 pound weight loss at one year versus four pounds in the low fat. Um, and the cardiovascular markers, so your C-reactive protein, which is a knocker of infl inflammation, was lower in the low carb. Um, your HDLs were higher in the low carb. Um, your triglyceride levels were lower. So although it doesn't look at mortality or, or heart attacks, it does it does show that some of your associated risk factors are actually improved with a lower carbohydrate uh, approach. And I think that this is, this is really, again, um, an interesting study, small, 100, I think 149 patients involved, but at least some evidence to support that low carbohydrate may be a reasonable way to go. 
So getting back to all the things that we, you know, we're going to try to touch upon is that physical activity is very important. In New Bedford, um, in, the, in the Healthy Aging Collaborative Study, we were, we were about 15% lower compared to the rest of the state in any activity over the last month. Our walk score is very high. It means we have accessibility to walk, so it means we've got to get out there and move. Um, this study actually said inactivity could be more deadly than obesity, so the patients that just moved a little bit more, okay, from being inactive, had a significant decrease uh, in their mortality. So even if people are overweight, they need to continue to move. This is part of the, you know, it may not be, you know, it's hard to necessarily exercise off the weight, but it's very important for your overall health. Um, 20 minutes a day would make a difference. This is from the author. We should be looking to do more than that, but any physical activity is going to be important. So this is a picture from one of our walks, and the benefits of walking decreases your risk of heart attack, weight management, hypertension, lipids, mood, um, strengthening bones. I mean, this is this is a pretty good thing, right? Getting out and walking is pretty simple. Um, and you know, I think that sometimes we get this um, notion that exercise has to be something where you're you're out abusing yourself at the gym, you know, or you know, if the no pain, no gain. And I think that ultimately um, that's not necessarily the case. Uh, and going for a brisk walk can be very helpful in a lot of different ways. And you know, I would say here, look, you know, we have a group of people um, in in. in Look at the smiles, right? So good, getting beyond um, you know, some of these health benefits, think about the sense of community, right? The sense of camaraderie and everybody pulling together. And I can tell you that several of my heart patients have been in these groups, right? So they also have a sense of support. So when they're walking, and there's several doctors and nurses there, um, that when they're walking with a group of people that, you know, or healthcare providers walking with them, they feel more supported. So this is the connectivity end of things that we really need to, in, need to focus in on. Um, We've been able to walk not only at Buttonwood Park over the last year, but we've also moved it inside. And for five months, we've done the walk. We've continued it on sat one Saturday a month in the mall. Um, and again, um, it's you have to find the resources or the places in your own community where you can keep moving, right? Because you know how often people come into my office and say, "Oh, weather's lousy, and I can't get out." And I, I look at them. I say, "Well, you can get to the upstairs in your house. Can you walk?" You know, five minutes after every meal, or could you walk ten minutes up and down your stairs, or can you get to the mall? You know, and, 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 and so we have to give them, you know, oh, I, I can't, I, yeah, it sounds like I could probably do something like that. So you have to give them ideas to keep moving, you know, and, um, you know, I, I'm always recommending go to the North Dartmouth Mall uh, because, you know, it's open and, and, and it's a safe place to walk. So think about you know, where, where within your own communities and the opportunities there are um, to keep moving. And you know, yoga is another thing. Um, this this yoga pose here is probably not been seen by the yoga instructors in the room. This is uh, <laughs> this is shoveling snow pose, which actually um, there was a uh, there was a YouTube that I saw about a month ago that they called it Yankee Yoga, and they had a whole bunch of poses that were. Uh, um, it, Shoveling snow, ache and back uh, pose, and a couple other things. Too long winter. There was another one in there. So you know, I think that you know, a couple things here is that you know, this is yoga is good for both mental and physical health. Okay, and you know, one of the things is is that it can be a great stress buster. And you know, sometimes in the hospital or in the office setting, we'll just take five minutes just to do some very very simple poses. You know, we're not talking about taking a whole class. But it's enough to kind of break it up, you know, and you know, especially when you feel in the moment that every that things are, you know, I don't have time, I can't do this, you know, and even the people that aren't participating in those five minutes, the ones that are laughing at it, that's just as good because laughter actually uh, opens up the relaxation response, and you know, I think that um, it can be that simple, five minutes, two minutes, okay, everybody, we're just going to get up and we're going to just do a couple poses, and at first everybody giggles, and then at the end of the day, people realize. I mean, people say, wow, I feel a lot better already, you know, because they've been able to kind of break that stress cycle that they've been in. So I think that, you know, yoga is fantastic. Um, it, uh, you know, there's some smaller studies that suggest that it can lower blood pressure, uh, improve cholesterol, uh, anxiety, and depression. Um, so I think that um, this is something that, you know, hopefully people will, will embrace uh, yoga as, as for what it is, um, a mind-body exercise. This guy's excellent, though, Dr. Metzel. He's doing iron strength, and he has classes in uh, Central Park where he gets 
you know, 50, 100 people out, and they're all doing, you know, high intensity interval training. And he's written a book, The Exercise Cure. Uh, he's got another book that just came out running. So, you know, this is this is this is another person that, you know, brings people's awareness is how important exercise is. And in my own practice, I mean. You could do high intensity interval training in four to seven minutes and actually get a pretty good workout. And there's evidence to suggest that some of these short, short bursts are very helpful for people. Um, John Rady is a psychiatrist in, in Boston who is, who's studied, who's written extensively on the on the uh, the importance of exercise for mental health. Um, his book Spark is highly recommended. And you know, he's going around the country and talking about how important you know, exercises for our kids, but also, you know, how exercise can affect, you know, kids that may have ADHD or patients with anxiety or depression. And, these, you know, his quote in the book is that, you know, exercise is like getting a small dose of Ritalin and Prozac. And when we think about how we change our brain chemistry, we think it's through pills. We change our brain chemistry, okay, through exercise as well. And in the United Kingdom, which embraced it before us, is for depression, one of the ways they treat depression so what does the AHA say? You know, basically, these, you can read it there, um, you know, 30 minutes of moderate activity, intensity, five days a week, 25, uh, vigorous. You know, we can go through all this stuff, and, you know, et cetera. We need to move, right? The bottom line is move more days than not. Get your heart rate up a little bit. You know, even if you're walking, what I would tell people is, is change your pace once in a while, okay? And you can do your own high-intensity interval training fast, slow. But really just make sure you keep moving. And any any activity, you know, again, exercise has to be, or whatever you choose to do, movement, has to be something that you enjoy doing, or you're not going to do it, right? If you're punishing yourself, you know, and actually I saw something that was really interesting the other day. If you go and punish yourself and then you eat something afterwards to, 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 to reward yourself, you're really negating that benefit of what you're doing, right? You're, you're, uh, I've rewarded myself for punishing. No, the fun should actually be the activity that you're doing, not to feel like you can eat that donut afterwards, right? Mm -hmm. So you should be enjoying the activity, not the reward for afterwards. This is more evidence that, you know, interestingly, leisurely joggers a couple times a week for a few, you know, for a few miles a day actually did better than people that were sedentary in terms of mortality, but also the people that were more moderate to, severe, to, to more strenuous joggers actually did a little worse. It, the problem with this study is that there weren't enough people in the strength in the real strenuous arm of things to make clear definitive um, definition that too much is too much necessarily. But what I would say is that leisurely jogging is really good for you. Okay? And you don't have to feel like you have to run a marathon. And same thing here. People that didn't run compared to people that just ran a little bit here. Okay, again, these are people that ran less than six miles per week, less and slower than six miles per hour, uh, just a couple of times a week made a big difference. This is a slide about high intensity interval training, and this shows that even a short burst can really improve your aerobic functional capacity, reduce blood pressure, and fasting glucose levels. This is a very small study, so it's kind of preliminary, but this may be something for people to consider. And, you know, if you only have, in the morning, if you only have four or ten minutes, you know, don't say I don't have time. There's always time. They, they're almost trying to look to see if you can get something out of a minute, and you probably can in some ways. So anything counts. So mental health, which I think is really important. Um, it, it's a problem for both of our communities. Um, depression, um, we're higher satisfied with life. We're much lower in New Bedford. And we need to figure out ways to keep people in balance. Uh, this was the cover of Time Magazine within the last year. And um, the mindful revolution really is here. And, you know, it, it has been a very important catchphrase or buzzword, so to speak, to bring people's awareness, um, um, to bring people to be aware, excuse me. So this was a study from about a year ago. And mindful meditation has moderate evidence to support improvements in anxiety, depression, and pain. Okay, so that's in, again, major medical journal, the Journal of American Medical Association, and, you know, they did a meta-analysis, and it has shown that anxiety, depression, and pain. And actually, there was a study many years ago that looked at patients that had psoriasis, and patients with psoriasis that had my, uh, mindfulness-based stress reduction program actually healed faster. Uh, this is my good friend, John Pierre Marks, who was kind enough to come down last year, and we did a workshop um, at the uh, Waterfront Grill, Healthy 
mind, healthy body. And again, this was a little bit of everything, mind, body, medicine. And, um, you know, it's true. A human being can, cannot be divided into parts that the whole must be considered in order to find the balance in physical, mental, and spiritual health. And, and that's exactly what I struggle with on a daily basis. People aren't balanced, right? If you're balanced, you're going to eat the right foods, right? If you're balanced, you're going to take care of your body. If you're balanced, you're going to take the time that you need in order to get your mind in the right place. But that's what we're struggling with. Um, this was from last fall, Loretta LaRoche, who is really a, a good friend of mine, fantastic in terms of, I, I gave, I, this is where at the, uh, at the end of the, at, at her presentation, I gave her a plaque that said she's really the doctor of um, stress reduction and laughter medicine. And she really is. So she, anybody who's seen her, um, she has incredible wit and really an incredible um, presence um, that she can bring. And she's an author, humorist. Um, and, and really, she really has been doing this kind of work to try to, to bring people to realize, you know, that how important taking care of your stress is. And, uh, you know, she's going to continue to be involved in the work that we're doing here. Um, and if anybody has not caught her, it's definitely worth it. Uh, John Kabat-Zinn, which I probably recommend on a daily basis to patients, um, has really been, you know, a world leader in terms of bringing mindfulness um, to the public. Um, John started the MBSR program, a mindfulness-based stress reduction program, in 1979 at UMass, and it really has, over the last five years, has really blossomed. Um, he's working and collaborating with, with, with investigators throughout the country, and they're getting the data. They're now getting, you know, um, a, uh, functional MRIs and functional studies that are supporting that the, the effects that MBSR can have. And the great thing is that these things become accessible. Um, you can get, you can download it on your iPhone, you can get CDs, you can read books, you can take the MBSR course online. So it's becoming more and more accessible uh, to get a hold of this. Herbert Benson, who started the Mind Body Medicine Institute in, in Boston, wrote the seminal book, The Relaxation Response, talking about how important. Um, it is to turn on the relaxation response, but also how damaging it is um, when we live in chronic stress. You know, again, the, we, we have separated the two out of Western medicine. We kind of feel like, well, the, the brain's over here, and you know, the body's over here. We have pills for that, and I don't know what goes on over there in the mind, but they can't be connected, right? But the bottom line is they are connected. You know, um, your stress hormones are going to be elevated, which is going to affect your blood pressure, your heart rate. Um, and then eventually lead to maladaptive behaviors in order to combat that chronic stress. So turning on the relaxation response, um, in his book, part of that was through transcendental meditation, but I would argue that there's many different ways to turn on the relaxation response. A warm bath, a massage, a, a cup of tea, exercise, what your favorite hobby is. So you have to figure out ways and it's not just because it's a good idea. And actually, interestingly, I would say that the times that you feel like you don't have time for that, those activities is what you need it most. Mm -hmm. And that's that's really what the important thing is, is that I think that what happens is, is we, fail, we, we fail to recognize how important those things are to maintaining balance in our lives. And that's what we, you know, again, these, the good news is, is we have science. The science says that when you're chronically stressed, it does terrible things to you, right? You know? So we need to do a better job of managing those things. Mindfulness may be useful in some of the elderly patients. There's a recent small study. Um, Short-term uh, benefits for patients that struggle with insomnia versus um, some of the other techniques um, that, uh, that they, they teach for uh, sleep disturbances. So I think that mindfulness can be useful for sleep as well. Um, and I think that there's a whole heck of a lot less side effects to trying um, mindfulness meditation rather than having to take pills. Um, this study here actually looked at, I think, a six-week course. So it wasn't like a meditate tonight, sleep well. It was more along the lines of patients that participated in a six-week program. And I think that's one of the important things to think about. You know, mindfulness and meditation are really things that need to be practiced on a daily basis. It's not like you flip a switch and all of a sudden everything goes away. Um, it becomes really something that you do um, on a daily basis. So anger can set up a heart attack, absolutely. Um, you know, and actually this study from the European Heart Journal actually said that in the, the ensuing hours after having an angry, angry encounter, 
you're a higher risk for a stroke and heart attack. So, you know, if that doesn't get your attention, if that doesn't show that there's a mind-body connection, well, I don't know what's going to, what, what it takes. We all need a sense of peace. And actually, we, um, Tim and Jessica and I were all actually, we, ha we had our sense of peace this morning. We're at the, this, is, uh, this is a tea from the Green Bean uh, in downtown New Bedford. Mm -hmm. Going on in terms of cardiovascular disease, broken heart syndrome, also known as Takotsubu, it's called Takotsubu because the, the heart looks like a octopus, um, a, uh, octo octopus jar, which is uh, from Japan. So that's the word Takotsubu comes from octopus pop. And you know, what happens is, is that in Takotsubo or stress cardiomyopathy, a patient has a very traumatic uh, experience. Somebody dies in the family. Um, and it look, they come in, it looks like a heart attack, and you look at the arteries and there's no blockages. Yet the heart function is down by about 50%. And you have this ballooning out of the bottom part of the heart. So again, if you can't believe that that's a real experience in terms of an acute stress rather than a chronic stress, um, then that I don't know what it takes for people to believe. Good news is about stress cardiomyopathy is they usually um, uh, resolve um, in weeks, a couple of weeks to months. Uh, and the hypothesis is, is that it's a, an extreme catecholamine response and uh, very rarely is it deadly. Uh, for the most part, it, it's recovering and it usually is with some kind of traumatic event in someone's life. I'll tell you how often I see patients for panic, panic-related disorders, right? You know, palpitations, giving you chest pain, um, sweats, um, dizziness. And, and you know, the thing is, is that we need to do a better job of recognizing um, how to treat this, or how to understand it, and, and to help patients. And I think that, um, you know, things that open up the relaxation response, whether it's through meditation, exercise, or yoga, um, and teaching these to patients or encouraging them is going to get back to the root cause problems. You know, if simply we hit the panic button and then we turn around and give them Ativan or some kind of medication to, to, to kind of numb them from their experience, they never really, really understand the tools necessary to handle what's causing their real problem. And that's what, you know, if we look at functional medicine or slow medicine or all these terms that are thrown out there, it's really getting back to what's really the problem. The problem isn't the heart attack, it's what led to that, right? The problem isn't, you know, the, the palpitations. The problem is, is that, you know, something's going on in your family. And we have to spend the time in order to understand that. You, know, you have to understand what's their social situation. We, we need to give patients back the, the time. Um, and sometimes it's not all that we can do in the, in the office visit. We sometimes have to start that discussion and start them with the tools or the direction that they need in order to understand themselves. Sleep, and this is my son. He's sleeping pretty well there. He's, he wasn't too happy that I put the nose on him. But <laughs> sleep is also very important, right? So we talk about diet, exercise, stress. Here's another S, sleep. So th these are two studies, large cohorts of nurses study. Uh, these are two large groups of nurses. And both of them basically said too little or too much sleep is bad for us. And it was kind of the sweet spot was probably seven to eight hours. Less than five hours, bad. Greater than nine hours, bad. Um, and higher, higher risks of cardiac disease. So, you know, sleeping is very important. And even for, you know, we look at our kids, right? We're, there's, I, see, I continue to see the debates about kids are not getting enough sleep and maybe your teenagers should be starting school later. There probably is something to that, right? And if you're not well rested, you're not going to be able to learn. You're not going to be happy and healthy. So Rosetto, anybody know about Rosetto? Pennsylvania, great story, right? So Rosetta, for 10 years in like 1955 to 1965, they had an extraordinarily low cardio, uh, uh, risk of, uh, me, a rate of uh, heart attack related death. And so, they, and then they looked at everything, the town next to it, they said, okay, well, what's different here? They share the same water supply. Um, so they really actually couldn't come up with anything because Fat, booze, cigarettes, but zero heart disease. So the idea was actually community. It was a very strong knit Italian American community, and actually they started to see the rates go up as some of those those social support networks seemed to break down over the years, and the heart rates of heart attacks seemed to go up. So I think that you know we seem to forget how interconnected we are. You know we think we're on our own island half the time, and it really is. Social support is really important for us. 
I'm not saying that everybody should go out fat booze and cigarettes and expect that nothing's going to happen if they have lots of friends, but I think that that's one other part of what the equation is, is making sure that we feel interconnected. And then, you know, let's look at a community, you know, up in Franklin, Franklin, Maine, you know, uh, uh, Franklin, uh, Franklin County up in Maine. And this community started about 50 years ago working on very simple things. How do we address hypertension, smoking, you know, um, cholesterol? And they showed that they could cut down the risk of cardiovascular disease, uh, cardiovascular deaths and, and mortality. So if they can do it, why can't we? And they were very simple, you know, in their approach. There wasn't kind of rocket science going on there. So what we have to do is we have to realize is that the, the answers to many of our questions don't have to be terribly difficult, but they have to involve what do you have in your own community. And, it, you know, we don't need to look outside. We need to look inside. And that almost has to go for everything. When we look inside, um, you know, usually when we blame our circumstances or way we feel, we look and say, well, they mean we do. It's something outside. But actually, usually the problem is within. And I would say the solution is usually within, too. So within your own community, what you have to look for are the people that are the resources. And, you know, I've been very fortunate that over the last year now, when I look within our own community in New Bedford, there's some incredible resources and some incredible people that have really pitched in. And because they realize that, you know, if we all work together, we can make a big difference in terms of the amount of suffering that goes on. And that's really what it comes down to, um, is, 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 re is reducing suffering. Um, and, you know, I'll just take a few moments here to talk about some of the people. You know, Mike Kudo over here um, was a teacher in New Bedford Public Schools, a wonderful songwriter. Um, he used to be a photographer for the Standard Times. He's done some great photography work. He's done most of the logo work. You know, Mark Kruger here was on um, The Biggest Loser, and he came and spoke to a group after one of our walks. Laura Brokel and Down to Earth have been incredible. They bring incredible energy to everything they do. And, you know, um, they, they run down to earth natural foods and carabiners, that, that family, and, you know, recognizing that, that we need to eat healthier. They, and they're all about healthy mind, body, and spirit. Jonathan Felix over here teaches at uh, Friends Academy. Um, he, tr he trained in uh, meditation at UC Berkeley. He gave a meditation class at Hawthorne for eight weeks. Tim Donahue is here with me today. He's doing fantastic work through meditation, yoga, nutrition, and exercise in our community. And, you know, I keep hoping that our school systems and other programs will start to embrace the work that he does because we're seeing the data that says, you know what, if our kids are happy and healthier, they're going to score better. They're going to stay in school. There's going to be less violence. And, and hopefully um, some of the uh, perceptions of what this work is will be broken down and realize how important it is the work that he does. Phil Paleologos, who is a radio personality, has been fantastic. I've reached out to him a bunch of times, and he's really been um, a wonderful resource and donated some of his time uh, for the fitness challenge. He came and moderated. He came and uh, moderated uh, when we showed the movie at the Wheeling Museum. And my friend Dave Weed over here has showed up with a camera at, I think, our second walk and is, 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 is part of the gang at this point. And uh, I really uh, have cherished our relationship and our conversations back and forth about uh, uh, helping both communities and working together. Um, I'm excited that, you know, again, this is the first time the New Bedford's had the fitness challenge. I know Paul Rivers has been ahead of the curve, uh, but I was you know, delighted when people asked me, he said, can you put your walk as part of it? I said, absolutely. And, you know, participated in the, uh, in the, uh, in the health fair and the, uh, the, the, the uh, panel discussion. And it really, you know, a lot of people, we had a, we had a great turnout last week for, our sec, for the second wellness walk, and people have really been buzzing about, you know, what a great program that's been. And this is the first time, and I think it really can build. You know, and I think that you have to be creative. You know, we, we, you know Einstein, what I believe his, his quote was, you know, the, the definition of insanity is doing the same thing and expecting a different result. And right now, we have to do something different, right? Because if we're not healthy and happy, then we need to figure out a different way. Um, what we've tried to do is we've showed a couple of movies. We showed the movie Fed Up. It was very well attended, which talked about uh, how added sugar refined grains is harming us. Um, the connection, mind your body, we talked about, and I had four of my friends show up 
um, actually three, Loretta couldn't make it that night, um, that, that practiced mind body medicine. And after we showed the movie, we had a panel discussion afterwards talking about what all of us do in terms of our own practices. Um, Jeff has some interesting work because he's trying to study patients that heal, spontaneously heal. And we look at the patients that get unwell, that become unwell, excuse me, but we don't look at people that get better that shouldn't get better. And then why do those people heal? Um, and I think that there's a lot for us to learn. The other thing is, is that cre creative ways to quit smoking. Um, Judson Brewer, who was uh, recruited from Yale to, to the Mindfulness Center at UMass, has got this great free app. He's put it out there, Craving to Quit, 21 days. Basically, it bugs you all day long to make sure that you know if, if you smoked, you didn't smoke, and it gives you mindfulness exercises, okay, that are guided. And it is something that's been shown to be twice as effective as the American Lung Association's Freedom from Smoking. And it's free on your phone app, a dollar a day on the computer. And so I think that we're starting to get more creative ways to quit smoking. Because I think that unfortunately a lot of the things, that, you know, I think that unfortunately people think that you get a pill and all of a sudden there's like this subliminal message that's going to tell you by taking the pill that, you know, that you're going to stop. It really, it, you know, if you have an addiction, it's a, it's a mind problem. You need to get mind exercises. And I think that when you're involving you know, meditation uh, in terms of trying to understand yourself and understand your addiction, this is brilliant. He's actually going to have it, it's going to be coming out in Spanish, and he's also told me that he's going to be working on one for obesity. Yeah. Joel Kahn, um, both of us, I think, are trying to put each other out of business at this point. Um, his book, he is a cardiologist at uh, Wayne State in Michigan, and he wrote the first book, The Whole Heart Solution, which I think is excellent. And he just recently came out with Dead Execs Don't Get Bonuses, which is actually available on Kindle. And again, many of the same principles. And actually, he's, he shares many of the stories of some of his patients in his most recent book to try to, 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 to try to shake us awake and realize that we play a role. And that, you know, he, his goal is to cut down a million heart attacks. And I'm with him. You know, I think that that's what we need to do is we really need to, to focus on prevention. Um, and, you know, he is... He's really working hard to put himself out of business. And I think that what it takes is an office. You have to change the way things happen in the office. And, you know, um, this is my secretary, Leah, um, two the nurse practitioners there, Minnie and Chris. I have, I have books in my office. This is not the usual um, office space. You know, we've got uh, salt, sugar, fat, whole heart solution, anatomy of an illness, mind your heart. So when patients are waiting between, you know, before I make it in the room, they're thumbing through this. Or if there's a book that I recommend, I pick it up and I show it to them. And, you know, that's the kind of thing is that we have to change our prescription pad. Okay? Our prescription pad used to just be for taking pills three, four times a day. Right? Our prescription really needs to be for lifestyle. And we can do that, right? We can change, we can really transform the way that patients interact with their disease processes. And even those, um, even those that become unwell, we need to give them the tools to recover. And I'll get into that a little bit afterwards. So this, this, somebody sent this to me recently, but I, I think that this is, per, this is perfect. You know, I, want, I want you to meditate for 20 minutes twice a day, exercise for at least 30 minutes a day, avoid processed foods, eat plenty of organic fruit and vegetables, spend more time in nature and less indoors, stop worrying about things you can't control, and ditch your TV, come back in three weeks. And you know what? <laughs> Not bad advice, is it, right? And this is, you know, I actually teach nurse practitioners that come to the office with me, and, and, and um, this book here is actually required reading before they show up day one. And uh, Bernard Lyon actually was, uh, he has a Nobel Prize, I think it's humanitarian. Um, and he was, he's, he still is a practicing cardiologist, but he was at uh, Peter Brent, Brent Brigham Hospital um, and developed a lot of, um, the, he, I think he was the first coronary uh, care unit that he developed. But his book, The Lost Art of Healing, gets back to, and they look, I like the subtitle, Practicing Compassion in Medicine. Um, and the, one of the quotes from the book that I took is, since preventive medicine that recognizes the most cost-effective approach to illness is time-intensive, it is completely ignored. And that's true. We need to give patients back their, we need to give time back, right? And we need to be their coaches. 
You know, one of the problems, I think, or one of the challenges in medicine is that we don't have that coaching mentality. You know, we told you to do this, do it. They come back, they don't understand. We have to do that with them. We have to continually remind them. We have to remind ourselves. And we also have to be examples. We have to be, you can't tell someone to do it if you're not living it, right? If you're not getting it done yourself, it's, it's, it's kind of hard to get other people to change. And the chance of survival is improved, whatever the illness, when the subject has cultivated a relaxed and philosophic attitude toward life, especially one accompanied by a sense of humor. And I think we've lost that too, right? We don't laugh enough. You know, where everything is, you know, so all these things, you know, they sound good, we all nod and we go, yeah, that's a good idea, right? That's, we should do that. We have to do it, right? We have to do it and it has a profound effect about, in, in, in regards, not only for our own well-being, um, but for the patient's well-being. And this is, you know, this is my good friend Gilda, who actually, you know, she, she's an example of, of, of health and wellness. So this is her quote, life is beautiful, don't let it slip by. Sure, life has its ups and downs. I've been there and sometimes you have to pick yourself up. Take care of your body with exercise which will take away your frustrations and get your body in gear. Avoid junk food and eat healthy. Find your true fence who will make you feel alive and so happy. Forget your age, and I'm gonna add that she's 90, um, and add a little wiggle to that walk. It's never too late. Enjoy what you have. If you follow these steps, I guarantee that you will become beautiful inside and out. And it really is what the prescription for life is. Um, anybody who ever gets a chance to meet Gilda will realize that um, I've never met anybody like her. Um, she still runs a, a nightclub at 90 years old and, you know, has more energy than anybody in the band. So, we need to do several things here, okay? We need to make, bring, bring awareness, okay? We need to let people know. And I think the prevention end of things is an active role. We actually have to do something. We have to actually walk with patients, show them that they need to eat well, that how important stress is. Um, and then we also have to take people that, that, have, that have fallen down and we need to bring them back through recovery. Um, and this, this was taken, the, the nurses at uh, St. Luke's actually put this up around the holidays and I love this picture um, in terms of an EKG and a heart. Um, so the idea is we can get better, um, we can improve and transform our community one step at a time if we all work together. And you know, it doesn't, it, it has to, it has to take everybody, it takes the village in order to improve this. It has to be that everybody buys in that we can get this done. Um, we have 900 people on uh, Facebook following at this point. Um, I also have, there's also a website now, so if you put people that don't follow Facebook, um, and we're, all, we're always looking for new ideas and, um, I think we really can make a difference. Awesome. Thank you.